Not doing this. Not doing this. I'm doing other stuff. Caught? No, that was only like. It's still like 2.30. <laughs> like half hour, like stuff. I don't know. So it's like, it was like, I was like, I should know. I was listening to the survey. Come on, let's see. Let's do like three times. No, can you read that? I'm just going to switch this one. What are you? I woke up and saw your story. Okay. Okay. Uh, who's got a buddy who's not here? My buddy is coming. Okay. See, is your buddy here? No, he's on your way. Okay. So who's not here? <laughs> Connor. He's literally on the way. Connor. Who's not here? Mo. Mara. Faisal. Who's else is not here? Mo. Xavier. Mo. David. Who else is not here? Kira. Kira. Isa. O'Denner. That's Kira. That's Isa. She's on the board, but she's not here. It's Tamar. Okay. Who else is not here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Don't forget Matt. Don't forget Cooper. Twenty-four. Is that it? Oh, what about uh? Mo. Oh, yeah. Is that it? Jake. Jared. Who? Oh, I'm so sorry. So how do you say it? You can say it tomorrow. I don't know. How does your mother say it? Tamara. Tamara. But it's so hard. Tamara. 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 Right? It's correct. Tamara. It's not that hard. No one says it properly. Your mother says it properly? She does. Okay. So that's that. So uh, when someone comes in, let me know. Okay. Who's that? Okay. Um, I apologize. When I told you how to label your videos, it's as if I didn't read the syllabus. The syllabus is very clear. Right? What does the syllabus say? The number. The number. So next week it's going to be 10. For this week, yeah. For, for Wednesday, it's going to be 10. And it's your last name. Your last name. Yeah. Uh, Fernandez. And then Dot. So dot City 20. But that's well, not what they. Specific, it's 10 dot of your last name. No, there's a No, the syllabus there. says do something else. What does the syllabus say? I'm glad we're having this, this pop quiz. Three, 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 three. Um, and then it's like this <laughs> Is it the title? Or it's like the place that you do it. It's like the place. And so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, it's it's yeah, 
pass. Thank you, Will. Um, because um, don't be surprised if your video content ends up on the uh, Wentworth Institute of Technology YouTube channel as something that uh, supports the awareness of the school of the world. Do you, is it okay if we use your content? If we think it's good? You don't have to agree. Yeah, we, we own it. We own it legally. So, um, so what does this mean, CC? Don't take a picture of it yet, because it's not done yet. So what place do you suggest um, Xavier uh, chooses next week? I mean, for Wednesday. Panama. Panama. Okay. So, should Xavier say Panama City, comma, Panama? No. No, just Panama. Place name. You don't have to say um, neighborhood, district, city, state, country, continent. You don't have to do all that. We know it's, we know where Panama is. <coughs> um, if it's like a specific, um, specific place like last week I did mine on like a specific park area mm -hmm. so is, should we put that area or should we put like what the city it? or should we put the state? Let's use the example. Well, what park was it? It was like the South Park, I can't remember the first word of it, but in Long Island, New York. I can't in Long Island City? So it's the name of a park in Long Island City, New York. I can't remember the name of that park. No. So maybe, maybe I would say Long Island City. If we're looking for a short name. Library of Congress has a list of proper place names. It's like 6,000 or 60,000, I don't know, place names. It should be recognizable for librarians. So if I were a jerk, I'd make you use that, but I'm not inclined, I'm disinclined. So, so some recognizable place. Okay, questions about that? So um, remember, remember this whole thing where you know, the school does whatever we can and then the rest is up to you, remember that part? And remember how important it is, the, the key to, to achieving this education is to recognize that your school is not going to do what is necessary. And so you should be a little pissed off, a little agitated, and you should be a little aggressive, and you should demand that you get as much as you can out of the school. You should demand from me a little bit better. I'm sorry, Professor Cotter, but yeah. you do a little bit better. That's the proper attitude to take in this course. Okay, so with that in mind, also with that attitude in mind, by the end of this class period, one of the things you should demand from your situation in your school is a clear sense of what to look for in a successful image analysis. Who's with me? Right. Friends don't let friends um, go, uh, go home from the lecture and then you know, just kind of forget entirely about the content we're working with. And then very late on Tuesday night, sit down and say, I think, isn't there something due? Don't, don't I have to do something by sometime tomorrow morning? Uh, that, that's not a good plan, right? A better plan, uh, rather than waking up uh, and saying, oh my God, I have this panic, I have to produce this goddamn video for that goddamn class tomorrow. Um, it's a much better scenario for you to take advantage of the fact that you don't have to perform 
for us today. You're, I'm going to be asking you some questions, and and um, you know, Will or Connor or somebody, you can leave it to them to shout out the answer that I'm looking for. And you can kind of, in the background, you can be very strategic in your use of time. And you can figure out what it is you're going to do as your image analysis based on this topic, right? So that's a good goal. These are life coaching tips, how to succeed in life how to, and starting with this class. Second, uh, remember that thing I told you to do when you're sketch writing, which is you know, get a sense of what is in the reading. And then based on your just ever so brief perusal, skimming of the reading, what, what, what do I have any chance of value to get out of this? What might I possibly get out of this reading? Because I'm going to invest two whole hour, one or two hours on this. Um, what might I possibly get out of it? I want to, because I'm sorry, I, ha I have to be convinced that there's something in this for me before I commit to doing it. I'm not just going to jump through your hoops, Wentworth. I'm going to jump through this hoop uh, enthusiastically or at a minimal level just to get a passing grade, depending on whether. I see value in it for me. Who's with me, right? This is the proper attitude. Okay, if there's something in it for me, what might there possibly be in this reading? Um, similarly, this lecture, what might I possibly get out of this goddamn lecture, which is the right attitude? I'm here, I got up, I got dressed, uh, you know, okay, what's in it for me? Someone paid a hell of a lot of money for me to be in this class. How much did someone pay for you to be here today for this one class? It's like a three-digit number. It's like a lot of money. So, so the appropriate approach to this lecture is, God damn it, there better be something in this lecture for me. OK, what do you think you might be able to get out of this lecture? Who wants to start? Well, let's, let's start with this. What, what did you take away from this, the reading you just spent all that time doing? What did you take away from the reading? Uh, let's assume there was something of value in that reading. What was it? What did you take away? What did you take away? Who wants to start? What did you get out of the reading? Go ahead. Manuel Delgado is a cool guy. Manuel Delgado. We knew that, though. Didn't we know Manuel Delgado is a cool guy? OK, let's, let's go this way, Mike. You were, you were going to say that? <laughs> did you, was, there, was there anything else that you could think of that was valuable? So we're going to go kind of in sequence in order so that you know what to expect. Like everyone but Michael knew what to expect. Like Han Jin is sitting there like, OK, I got to be ready because I'm next. Go ahead, Han Jin. What did you take away from the reading? What? What? Recognizing the current situation is on the side of the world. Recognizing the current situation on the other side of the world? Yes. OK. Well? Um, modernity is about like top-down planning and rigid structure. But um, like modern planning has to be reflexive and taking into account like the human condition in certain sites and like responding to that. Yeah, that would be cool. I forgot your name. Aiden. Aiden, 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 Aiden. Aiden. So uh, it was kind of like the same with Lowe's that we need to have, like, when we design, you have to have the intent of reflexivity and being able to react to certain situations in order to, like, help the individual to develop. Right. There's a lot more at stake than just pretty. Yeah. 
No. Yeah, that's right. Um, and get ready, we're going to the back row because we're at the front row. Now we're going to go to the back row. And the game, well, we'll start with Isa. Okay, so go ahead, Mom. Well, like how the, the CD changes uh, unwittingly in response to or in refer to the, the, economic, the economic and social features changes. Right, so there's lots of systems that are that's not changing. It's just the unwitting trigger, like yeah. with no clue, or yeah. with no, yeah, with no intention of changing this. Right. The designers weren't intentionally making these changes. It just happened. Right. Okay, Isa. <coughs> um, so for the back row, it's That's big. Okay. Connor. I said, uh, as we enter a new age of modernism, in a time where many people are not living under the best conditions, we must focus on places in dire need of further development before we can continue to improve the areas that have already, that are already functioning well enough. Okay, good. And you are Jared, Jared. Yeah. It seems like, like one of the things I got from it was just how, um, we can kind of focus our design on that they can be less formal and like rigid and how we can kind of react to what the environment's doing and try to like kind of react to the issues that are coming up and not just what we think is gonna happen. Right. Chris. <clears throat> so like when we design in the future we have to design with intent. So like in the case of like when they're saying we're talking about like the metas, mm -hmm. um, they're saying like we need concrete results to like come from like what we do. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking like to like basically designing with intent and not like just all really like all loosely. Mm -hmm. right. uh, like I don't know was uh, design is kind of the tool that we have to kind of reverse the, the structure of like one energy for energy that there already was because of the, the whole like, Indian religious system and like building a city with like an ideal and plan but not actually like making a city to like make social change and kind of transform what's already there. And kind of being more flexible in design. Right. The cause and effect. And I forgot your name. Bradley. Bradley, Bradley, Bradley. 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 So the one thing that I got was that, uh, like, in order to get, like, a society that can all function together to actually be incentivated to change, you have to educate, like, all, of all scales of the communities. Yeah, that's good. Odaner. Odaner. <laughs> um, what I got from it was like that architecture can turn like uncontrollable complex into opportunities. How they use like the libraries to train the the soldiers. Yeah. 
not to be soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. Something else. Okay. I got out of it. Um, high modernism failed the informal city, and whereas second modernism is now taking the approach of going at the informal cities because we realize that ignoring the majority of the population is a negative aspect. Yes. See. Um. When really I took that, like the locality to have like the same social and cultural issues <coughs> until we can find like a definitive answer that's not like not particularly through architecture but through a way that um, will settle like will settle social issues as they did in Medo in Colombia mm -hmm. um, in terms of being able to just like sincerely um Like being able to sincerely, um, I guess just answer the issues that they have. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not architecture alone, it's architecture as a vehicle for and in partnership with these other things. Tamara. So, one small thing that got my attention was when they were talking about the negative tendencies mm -hmm. of the um, market and everything that it was. Um, that they said when that was placed into reflex, like reflexive, reflexivity, mm -hmm. or reflecting on it, that these things could also become good instead of just right. negative, well, that well, they well, can well, be trans transformative. Yeah, into positive. Yes. And I'm sorry, I forgot you. Asia. Asia. Yes. Asia, Asia, Asia. 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 Uh, I think what I found interesting was how like they compare, not compare, but try to find a relationship between Middle East and Singapore in terms of its like social transformation. Mm -hmm. Because like the Middle East uh, social transformation is like unmistakable, but we also the people issues so it was interesting like talking about like comparing it with Singapore and then asking like, like just asking and having no answer right That's the interesting part. yeah okay so uh, that's that's a pretty good harvest of takeaways Delgado's cool we already knew but all these other things um, now now, how about this lecture? I mean, you've seen this outline before. I'm going to take another lap through familiar material. Um, what is it that you have a right to demand out of as a, as a valuable takeaway from this lecture? We're not going to go one by one. Just shout it out as it comes to you. What, remember, someone paid a lot of money. You got up. You spent, you're going to spend two hours here. What do you have the right to demand? Go ahead, Xavier. Um, I would say, like, how does reflexive, like, this idea of, like, second modernity, like, affect our architectural education? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the point of studying this unless it has some value to how uh, we uh, attack our careers? What else? What else? On a, on a good day, what would you get out of this lecture that I'm about to attempt? Yeah. Well, I mean, I kind of read the lecture, and then I kind of, um, post reading the lecture, kind of thought about it, and like realized that society now is like in its own current modern era, in terms of, um, we're going through a lot of, like, um, not just like the U.S. world, but like internationally, a lot of political and economic issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so in which case, like, as they were going through and trying to answer their issues with whatever means that they had. Um, locally. In that same sort of way. Yeah, so locally, as they dealt with the problems locally. Go ahead. I'm trying to paraphrase what you're saying. Oh, no, I mean, like, I'm just, um, like, taking that, like, and taking, like, a, um, after, like, reading the, like, the reading, after reading that, um, like one, like a person can say that those those same aspects now can be applied today because like um, at least in my personal opinion like we're going through social and like 
um, cultural changes. Mm -hmm. um, so in which case it's like we can we we could potentially use architecture as a means of like developing a legitimate um, pathway for the rest of like the country. Right. So the lessons from these local uh, the way problems were dealt with uh, in these specific instances in recent history can help us use architecture to uh, mm -hmm. forge a path forward that would solve a lot of the problems we're facing today. Is that, is that a fair? Okay. Who else? What, what else? Uh, do you have uh, an optimistic expectation from this lecture? Okay. Well, let's go with that. Um, one reasonable expectation is um, that there's going to be, you know, we've talked about these things before. Um, if it's something that you feel like you've already, you've already, uh, you already have what you need, let me know. Like, um, I'm, I'm going to count especially on Olivia. Oh, you know who you are. Just let me know if you already got this stuff, right? Uh, you know, we're good. You don't have to. You don't have to go through the whole Singapore thing again. I got it, right? So let me know because I'm. I'm not always. I play through these things over and over in my head, um, while I'm awake and while I'm sleeping, and so I lose track of what I uh, covered in depth. So help me out. All right. So reflexivity, you all know um, the reflex system. Um, when I taught the class last year, Hanjun, uh, you know, I had everyone cross their legs because the doctors don't do this anymore, do they? They do. They do? How many people have had the doctor take out a rubber mallet and hit their knee? How many people have not? Okay, so most people have, but basically, uh, Xavier and Mo, you know what it is. You, you do this and it, it kicks. If, you know, if I do this, you know I'm faking it, right? But that's a reflex. So at the very root of this whole thing uh, is the meaning of the word reflexivity. It starts with this one meaning, which is reflex. And when face out, you when, when you say, we have to reflex this, architecture has to reflex this, I don't know what you mean. Like, I'm trying to figure out what that means. Um, and, Damara, when you say, I think you said reflex as if it means reflect. Does reflex mean reflect? No. It's not exactly. There's an overlap. Olivia. Yeah. What is happening. So I think it's fair to say that the first part of a reflex is uh, a, an action that is being reflected. So the two meanings of the word reflex is um, the two aspects that I think that are worth remembering is it's automatic, right? You don't you don't think about kicking your your leg. It just it happens automatically. It's built into the system. It's an automatic system response. So it's a, it's a system behavior. It's a characteristic of a system behavior. It's automatic, and it, it acts on itself. So reflexive. Uh, and remember, we did the Spanish verb thing. You know. Uh, who speaks Spanish? So what's the, what's the reflexive verb to wash? In, avarse? So avarse means to wash oneself. It's a reflexive verb. So it's, it's an action that I am acting on myself. Are there other reflexive verbs? For wash? No, for other, you know, there's wash is one reflexive verb. I had a slide, but I, it's, 
It's not in this. Anyway, the two meanings of reflex is it's automatic and it acts on itself. Okay? So it's kind of like reflect, but reflex, reflexive is more than just reflecting. Uh, it's, it's taking action. Uh, you remember the negative feedback loop where um, it's the basis of all computer algorithms and the basis of, I'm pointing over here as if there's a thermostat, but where at Wentworth. So there is no reflexive uh, system for the temperature. We have to call the office of thermostat, the vice president of thermostat, and the vice president, we have to say to the, actually you call Carrie, and Carrie calls the vice president of thermostat, and the vice president of thermostat, when he gets the word, he, he unlocks the key, and he turns the big dial that changes the temperature of the entire place. Right? So it's not a reflexive system. The thermostat was invented in the 1880s by Carrier, and um, we had them throughout every building everywhere, but Wentworth decided someone should control the temperature, and so we don't have it anymore. Um, so this is supply and demand curve. This is the mechanical governor. And just, uh, I thought that people could use a little bit of a sense of how a mechanical governor works. Um, this is how it works. The faster this spins, the further out these weights are sent, and this lever goes up. And so the idling, if you have a car from the last century, from a long time ago, there's one of these in there. And that's how the engine idles at the right speed. Has anyone taken apart an old engine before it was all electronic? Anyone? OK. Well, so this is the classic mechanical analogy of a reflexive arrangement. It's like a thermostat. It works on negative feedback. The faster it goes, uh, the, the more the throttle closes down, so less fuel gets to the engine. And um, the less fuel that gets to the engine, the more it slows down. So that's how the idle works in an old car. And then how does um, economics work? And of course, you understand the idea of equilibrium. That is the only place where the quantity demanded exactly equals the quantity supply. You should also understand why when there's a change in price that moves along the curve. For example, when the price goes up, the quantity supply increases and the quantity demanded decreases, causing a surplus. When the price falls below equilibrium, the quantity demand increases, the quantity supply decreases, and that causes a shortage. And that's what happens when there's a change in price. It moves along the demand and supply curves. But what if there's a shift in the entire curve? Remember, we learned the shifters in previous videos. There's five shifters of demand, and there's five shifters of supply. To understand. So the, the supply and demand is a dynamic system where when one thing changes, the system responds to create balance. And so this is, uh, this is more important than the thermostat. This is, uh, this is how markets have operated before we even understood how markets operated. This is like a scientific observation of human behavior. Humans respond to uh, supply and demand forces, and this is just how it works. And there's a strong association with this understanding and the system of economic uh, management called capitalism. But there's more to capitalism than just the reflexive operation of markets. But why are we even talking about economics at all? The reason we're talking about economics, uh, the, the reason we got to this topic, the reason that we're even learning this subject in a way that's different than the way it was taught in the 20th, 20th century when I studied it, the reason we're here is because we as architects, when we look at the world and we say, uh, what role is there for someone like me, an architect? 
uh, the answer we get is, uh, well, first we say, well, where are there problems that uh, I can have an impact on? And uh, so we identify problems and we ask ourselves questions. Well, why is this the way it is? Why is this a problem? And so um, when it takes us away from architecture, um, we get nervous and we get uncomfortable, but we have, if we want to know why the world is the way it is, you, we have no choice. We have to go there. When I was, I remember vividly when I was a sophomore in architecture school, I had, it was like the fifth year I was in college. I was a, so after five years of college, I found myself as a sophomore in architecture school. I remember vividly walking down the aisles of the library and saying, it was all this um, engineering stuff. And I said, ah, thank God, I don't need to know anything about that. And I walked down the next aisle. It was all this history. I don't need to know anything about this. And I walked down the next aisle. And there's all this economics and sociology and anthropology and fill in the blank, physical sciences. I didn't need to know any of this stuff. Phew, all I needed to go down is the aisle NA 0 through 9000, and that's where the architecture books were. And I was so relieved. And I feel like everything that's happened since then has been like revenge against my ignorance of thinking, I don't need to know any of these things. Because since then, I looked at Dubai and I said, well, what's up with Dubai? Why is Dubai? What's going on with Dubai? And you can't understand why Dubai is Dubai unless you leave the architecture part of the library. I lived in Indonesia for five years, and I was like, well, why, why poverty? Why informality? Why disasters? Why this? Why that? Why this transportation? Why are my friends facing these challenges in their lives? Architecture is only part of the answer. In order to figure this stuff out, you have to truly mean it when you ask why, and you get into these other things. And for better or worse, it turns out that... The, Let's say Mr. Blue. It turns out that architecture is intertwined with all of these forces. So you have to know about Jimi Hendrix and feedback loops. And today... Prisoner's Grant Dilemma. Each been arrested for some minor crime. Did we do this? I think they committed a more serious crime, but they don't have enough evidence to convict them. They need a confession. They take them and put them in separate rooms so they can't talk and play a little game. To try to force a confession, the police give them each a choice. Admit your partner committed the crime and you will go free. We'll pardon you for the minor crime, but your partner will have to spend three years in prison. If you stay silent and your partner lets us know that you were the one who really did it, then you're going to have to go away for three years. They know that the police don't have any evidence, and if they both stay silent, then they will only go to prison one year each for the minor crime. If they both betray each other, then they'll both go to prison for two years each. Okay, each partner can do one of two things. Game stay theory. Or betray. Staying silent would be cooperating, and betraying would be defecting. If they both stay silent, then they each spend a year in prison. If one betrays and the other stays silent, then the betrayer goes free, and the silent spends three years in prison. If they both betray, then it's two years each. So what are they going to do? Well, they should cooperate. That's the best option for the group, if we add the total number of years in prison. But let's take it from Red's perspective. If she thinks Blue is going to stay silent, then she should betray so she can go free. Going free is better than spending a year in prison. If she thinks he's going to betray her, then she should definitely betray. Two years in jail is better than three and being made a fool of. Blue is in the exact same situation and will think the exact same thing. He should betray if she stays silent, and he should betray if she betrays. They should have both cooperated, but from an individual standpoint, they notice they could always gain by defecting, if they have no control over what the other person's going to do. So they'll both defect to try to better their own situation, but come away not only hurting the group, Does that but make sense? themselves. Individually, they're worse off than if they both cooperated. This situation is pretty made up, but it has some real-world analogs. A common example is with marketing. Let's say two cigarette companies, Red Strikes and Smooth Blue, are deciding how much money they should spend on advertising. Since the product they each make is identical to one another, advertising has a huge impact on sales. For simplicity, let's say their choices are to advertise a bunch or not advertise at all. And there's just 100 people in the society and they all smoke. 
If both don't advertise, then just by random chance picking cigarette boxes, 50 people buy Red Strikes and 50 people buy Smooth Blue. At $2 a pack, they each make $100. Let's say advertising costs $30. If one person advertises and the other does not, then 80 people will buy the cigarettes from the ads and 20 people buy the other ones. The advertiser makes $160 minus $30 for ads and comes away with $130. The non-advertiser didn't spend any money but only made $40. If they both advertise, again half will buy Red Strikes and half will buy Smooth Blue. But since they both spent $30 on advertising, they only come away with $70 each. Same deal, both people cooperating and not advertising is the most preferable situation. But both companies can see that advertising will always make them more money. But unlike the prisoners in jail, these companies can talk and try to influence each other. From here, Blue would be better off if Red didn't advertise. Red wouldn't go for that because that would be worse for them. Blue could try to convince Red that they would both not advertise, the only other situation where they're both better off. But without any real obligation to each other, there's nothing that's stopping them from trying to advertise to gain more of the market anyway. If you think your opponent's gonna not advertise, then you're better off advertising. Although, we're still making assumptions to make this situation work too. With this model, we're assuming they only play once. The game changes when the players have a chance to build a relationship and work together to get more gains over time, or punish each other by not cooperating. Also, to make the model work, we have to make up rules for the players. Assume they're basically computer programs with predictable actions. These guys are creepier than they were in my head. They were supposed to be cute. For the prisoner's dilemma and other similar models, we're assuming they are rational agents. A rational agent is a hypothetical person that will always pick the option that they predict will work out best for them. They're not really thinking about the gains of someone else. Seems selfish, but it is something that real people generally do too. People always want what's best for themselves, and we don't like to be made a fool of. But if you put real people in the prisoner's dilemma, people don't always defect like the model predicts. In one study, 40 people playing prisoner's dilemma games through a computer without ever meeting or talking, only playing each opponent once, these are one-off games, using a payoff matrix that looks like this, cooperated an average of 22% of the time. These people never cooperated, these people always cooperated, these guys cooperated on half of their games and everyone else is in between. This is a lot of cooperation coming from a model that predicts no cooperation. Operation. The largest group did act like rational agents, but most people try to cooperate at least once. It's because well, there's more to real people. We are social creatures, and even in one-off scenarios with no guarantees or obligations and no chance to build a relationship, we're still thinking about how the group might decide. We're actually thinking from the perspective of the group and making an optimistic decision. Cooperating an average of 20% of the time might not seem very optimistic, but remember this is with absolutely no communication or obligations. Anyways, that's not really the point. Using rational agents is still useful. The model is just trying to point out the dilemma in certain situations where people are actually hurting themselves when counterintuitively they're only thinking about themselves. And that's why we're modeling using the cold robotic psychopaths. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Questions? So back to uh, what's in it for you. What does, so this, the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons are classic uh, examples of game theory. There's, how many of you have heard of game theory? Has it come up at, uh, and what other context has game theory come up? Where, where have you heard about it? Architecture or not? Not architecture. So um, what might game theory have to do with what we do in the architecture studio? Go ahead, Justin. So like when making a decision, maybe like even usually for a design, like right now we're design analysis and making a decision will impact someone's, so like say you want to like emphasize a certain room circulation, and that might be nice for people trying to move through there, but there's people that also maybe don't want people, like the, tra the traffic that comes with getting people moving back to the circulation. Good point, Olivia. Right, in a more simplistic model of architectural practice. Uh, the rich white male uh, client comes to us and says, 
hey, I'd like you to design something for me. And it turns out that it's not a house in the woods, it's actually something in the city where there's public space. And the client is often, maybe always, the client's interests are in some, in some aspect uh, in opposition to what is in the best interest of the stakeholders, which is actually everybody in the city. Like, uh, the client might say, I would like to um, have a safe uh, facility, so please put a blank wall along the sidewalk, because I don't want any windows or doors that could be broken into. I want uh, the people who work in my office building to drive in and park and come up the elevators. I don't want any pedestrian entry because all my employees are uh, automobile users. Um, that's a case where um, the client has a specific point of view that if, if carried to its logical extreme actually does harm, does actual real harm to everybody else because there's the pepper spray test. Remember that? Uh, you are a woman, you're walking down the street, your parents care about you, so they make sure you're carrying uh, pepper spray in your keychain. You turn the corner, and all of a sudden, uh, the, the, the building has no windows. Well, if you were, a, now you're also um, a, uh, not a burglar, what do you call it, a robber. You wanna, you're a mugger, you, you have this, uh, addiction and you need all you care about is your next hit where are you going to find money uh, what you, who are you going to steal money from um, and where are you going to do it I'm going to steal money in front of that building with no windows and doors and um, and so there's two players in the there's three or four players in this there's the architect the client uh, the young woman with the pepper spray and the drug addict Right? And so these players, by using game theory, uh, some cities, by using this game theory, which some would say is actually historical reality, statistically we find that uh, there are concentrations of crime on streets with uh, fewer windows, fewer doors. Jane Jacobs was in the reading. Uh, the theory of eyes on the street, that the more windows and doors uh, and uh, eyes, the more people who have view of a street, the safer that street is. And so if you're a, uh, a woman, a young woman, and you're not stupid, uh, you, you, and you've been around a bit, you know intuitively as a reflex, as a reflex of response, you turn the corner and you're walking down the street and you notice that there are fewer windows and doors, uh, there are no lights on, your reflex is you reach into your pocket to make sure your pepper spray is handy, right where you thought it was, and then if it's, if it's really bad, you, 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 you walk around, you take a longer route. So all of these things are playing out, uh, and it's important in the studio to be able to put yourself in these shoes uh, through the act of empathy uh, to understand the position of the young woman, even if you're not a young woman, the uh, robber, even if you're not a robber, of the client, even if you're not experienced as a client. One of the ethical professional responsibilities of the architect is to be able to picture uh, the, the decision space of all the actors. So I'm gonna use this idea of decision space which is a key concept of game theory. What are the choices available for each player in the system? And what are the motivating factors behind each person in the system? And by understanding uh, the decision space of the actors, you can understand, you can start to understand why the world looks the way it is, why Dubai is what it is. Um, why uh, global climate change is happening. Why does the president of ExxonMobil, uh, who's a really nice guy, he's smart, he's a good parent, uh, he's a great neighbor, he volunteers, uh, he coaches the Little League team for his daughter, 
all these things. He's a great guy. Why does he continue to uh, destroy the planet um, more than any other single individual on the planet? He's a good guy. Um, it's important to understand the decision space of the president of ExxonMobil. Um, so if someone were going to graduate and become the president of ExxonMobil in the class today, who would it be? Kai? You? Okay. So is Kai a good guy? Well, <laughs> what if the reason Kai wants to run ExxonMobil is to keep, name someone who's, like you know in your dorm, do you share a kitchen? So you know how messy that sink is? <sighs> who, who did this? Who keeps leaving their mess in the, in the sink? The three same people who do it every single time. Who is it? Or the seven same people. Tanner. <laughs> so Tanner, let's just talk about Tanner. Yeah, let's talk about Tanner. Okay. Yeah. And you can tell him that we, you can thank him. He was very useful in this course. He's not very useful in washing dishes. So Tanner and Kai are the two people who are competing for the job as president of ExxonMobil. Uh, from Kai's point of view, right? Why is it so important that Tanner not be the president of ExxonMobil? Because he can't even wash his dishes. Right. <laughs> he is an irresponsible actor yes. when it comes to the, the common resource, the, common, the shared resource, the common pool resource of the commons, which here is the meadow where the sheep graze. Uh, but in the dorm room, it's the sink. Come on, Tanner. Yeah, Tanner. You know, look at the look at the sink as a limited resource, and look at it from the point of view of the people you share the sink with. Don't be such a self-centered schmuck, right? Exactly. Did we already watch this video about the yes. tragedy yeah. of the commons? Yeah. And you got it, right? Got it. So you know how important it is that someone who cannot imagine the decision space of the other people around them, like Tanner, you know how important it is for someone who cannot grasp the logical outcome of this limited resource, which is the planet, Tanner must not become the president of ExxonMobil. Who's with me? Yeah. Okay. Here, here. Is Kai going to do a better job? Definitely. Okay, Kai, congratulations. Welcome to ExxonMobil, the executive suite. Kai is now uh, the, the chief executive officer of of ExxonMobil. Okay, Kai, what are you going to do as one of the most influential people in terms of the fate of the planet? Infiltrate on the inside and destroy ExxonMobil. Okay, what's your first, what's your first move? I like it. What's it? End all drilling. End all drilling. Okay, so um, can you do that? Can you do that? Absolutely. Well, uh, you went, who do you answer to? Right. Who hired you? Who hired you? Doesn't you did. The, the, board. Board. the board of directors board. acting in the interest of the shareholders. I'll tell them to invest in another energy option. And they will. And you go bankrupt. Nuclear. <laughs> right? So, Justin, say that again. You go bankrupt after Who will go bankrupt? ExxonMobil? Okay, so let's say. Let's say Kai keeps his secret plan totally under wraps until he arrives in the executive suite. And at the first meeting, he says, gentlemen, because it's probably all gentlemen, uh, uh, we're going to uh, take a new direction. Uh, how successful is Kai? Let, OK, let's say he is successful. Let's say that he is so good. He's like the Mikhail Gorbachev. And I say Mikhail Gorbachev because he became premier of the Soviet Union. And uh, before anyone could notice, he ended the Soviet Union, right? Wow. Whew. Good luck, Kai, matching that. Um, so let's say Kai keeps it completely secret. He actually manages 
to uh, shift the resources of one of the largest corporations on the planet away from planet killing activities, what happens to ExxonMobil share price? It drops. What happens to ExxonMobil's market share of the huge petroleum industry industrial complex? It, it, someone else moves in. We have British Petroleum, we have Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, we have all the other oil companies, and they say, thank you, Kai, thank you, ExxonMobil, thank you very much, we will take your market share. So the lesson, and, and this is actually how uh, the economic system of the world has played out, that's why there are so few oil companies is because a few try to make, break from the mold, and they go away, they get bought up. Before ExxonMobil disappears, it will be purchased by a competitor and absorbed, and they will continue business as usual with less competition, more monopoly, more control, they can do whatever they want. So it actually, um, so now, maybe Tanner should have been the one to become President of Exxon. No, okay, no, yeah, no, let's, no. let's not get carried away. Do you want dirty dishes all over ExxonMobil? Exactly. <laughs> Do you want to take the, the problem of the kitchen sink and extend it to the entire yeah. planet? Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, it's going to be laundry right? everywhere. Right, I know. I'm Tell me about laundry. it. So, so this is an example. Like, so a lot of environmentalism is focused on the people, the personality. Uh, it might be the President of the United States that you're focused on, but long after the President of the United States is off out of the picture, the forces that created the situation will be still in motion and playing out. So the next time you feel like cursing at the leader at the top, and if they weren't, if they weren't such a tanner, right, things would be much better, you know, it's sometimes, and, and that might be true, that might be true, but take this president out, take uh, the president of ExxonMobil out, take Tanner out of the situation. You have other roommates, right? Yeah. If Tanner can go, but the situation is the same. There's no, there's insufficient motivation um, or incentive for, for whoever is now took Tanner's room to clean the sink, to keep his stuff out of the sink. And don't get me started on the stuff in the fridge. Well, that's when you just start throwing stuff in the trash. Exactly. So that's an incent, that's a change. So now you're changing the incentive structure. You are altering the decision space. And now it's not about Tanner. It's about the rules of operation of the system. It's about the operating system. It's about the sink. It's about the operating system that surrounds the sink. And part of the sink's operating system is the physical design of the sink itself. You are cursed with a single compartment sink. It's way less deep than every other sink right. on campus. OK. Let's say you had a, a small compartment and a large compartment sink, right? And that would allow you, so that's a, that's a change of the physical system it's also architecture, right? So now we're actually getting to the architecture part of this. When you change the physical arrangements of the sink, you make possible a new set of rules, such as all the dirty stuff has to go, has to go in the big sink. You with me? Connor, yeah, stick with me. You're in the dorm, you, you have a, you, the, the landlord comes in, they take out uh, they take out the, the single compartment sink and they put in a two compartment sink and you guys have a, a dorm uh, a apartment meeting, you have a house meeting and you say okay from now on all the dirty stuff goes in the small sink if it doesn't fit in the small sink um, you got to clean it and if it's there for more than 12 hours uh, uh, it goes in the garbage can or something, you know something extreme so now because the physical this, the physical arrangement has changed, there are new rules available. 
and you can change the rules, all of a sudden, even if Tanner hadn't been kicked out, even if Tanner were still there, even Tanner, that might be enough for someone as pig-headed as Tanner. He might even start cleaning up after himself because you changed the rules of the game. You changed his incentives, okay? So, if you want to understand why the world is such a mess, you kind of have to understand not just the physical arrangements, but the incentive structures, the rules, uh, through a game theory perspective that are attached. Just like the two compartment sink versus the one compartment sink, there are a set of rules that uh, that are become attached to the different arrangements. And so using this as a template, let's look at some important uh, city and architectural arrangements and see what the rules uh, look like. Um, we've, we've talked about this. Uh, if the big system where, uh, we talked about this last week and last summer, if the biggest single uh, game in town, in terms of game theory, if the biggest single game in your lifetimes is the uh, carrying capacity of the planet, let's create a, a game model for the carrying capacity of the planet. And that's what uh, the people at Anthropocene.org have done. Uh, and they have identified nine planetary thresholds. There are nine aspects that um, everything else can do whatever it wants, but if one or more of these thresholds is surpassed, then the, we are in trouble at a planetary scale. So in the pre-industrial era, uh, we don't really know. We don't have the data. So let's go up to, uh, this is 1950. So in 1950, we still are missing a lot of data because the science uh, wasn't there. But we do have data on uh, species extinction. This is half of the, uh, the planetary threshold for biosphere integrity. We need to have biosphere integrity within safe operating uh, parameters uh, in order to not put the planet at risk. Already by 1950, we had extreme uh, species and extinctions that put us at risk. I don't think that one's going to change as we go forward. The next uh, snapshot is 1970. So we're starting to get uh, uh, climate change, and this is primarily carbon, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that will heat up the planet. And we have this other thing, which is this is the one uh, that gives us the most hope. This is the ozone depletion in the, at in the upper atmosphere. You've heard about this, ozone, the ozone layer. What does the ozone layer do? It's breaking apart. Mm -hmm. no. it's the gas. Why do we need the ozone layer? Oh, it takes away heat radiation. Oh. Right, infrared radiation is reflected off of the ozone uh, content of the stratosphere. It reflects it back out into space and keeps us, uh, especially those of us with chronic terminal uh, melanin deficiencies. Who's, who's that? So those of us with chronic terminal melanin deficiency, we are at risk of skin cancer. Can you expand on? White people. <laughs> So those of us with chronic terminal melanin deficiencies are at especially heightened risk for skin cancers resulting from uh, exposure to the sun, especially in the absence of a working ozone layer. So since it impacts white people, um, let's do something about it, okay? So what can be done? Is there any hope? Look at that. Here we are at 1990. It looks hopeless. What does a properly behaving reflexive system behavior look like when threatened by something like uh, the surpassing 
moving into a zone of high risk in a planet, a crucial, one of the nine crucial planetary, um, what do you call them? Thresholds. What do we do? What was the historic response to ozone depletion? Banning PVC, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. So, and as architects, I've I've been specifying a heating system <clears throat> for this community, and we can't use chlorofluorocarbons anymore. We have to use hydrofluorocarbons, which are only slightly better. So I have to talk to the client. I say, you know. Chlorofluorocarbons are the highest performing substance in your heat pumps. We have a ground, ground source heat pump system that heats and cools using the temperature of the planet. So it's, it's one of the cutting edge green technologies available to us. It's a huge game changer in terms of um, uh, fuel efficiency. But it uses uh, this toxic to the planet. Um, it used to use chlorofluorocarbons. Chlorofluorocarbons were banned. And in a typical industry move, they said, <clears throat> there is no conclusive scientific evidence that hydrofluorocarbons deplete the ozone layer. And the key thing there is, there is not yet any conclusive scientific evidence. But, sorry, hydrofluorocarbons are almost as bad as chlorofluorocarbons. But currently, that's. Um, the big thing we did, that's, that's the only alternative we have. There are a few greener things, but they're far less efficient. So this is one of the problems that engineers and the building industry and arch thus architects have to face. Um, but what we did do is we um, passed laws internationally, cooperatively, across, we signed a treaty across hundreds of countries. And we eliminated the use of chlorofluorocarbons in aerosol cans. And here we are uh, in 2015. <clears throat> we were actually successfully, that reflexive system response of the international treaty to push back on the use of chlorofluorocarbons resulted in pushing the stratospheric ozone depletion levels back into the safe operating zone. Thank you very much. So that's a, that's a happy moment. So why can't we do that for these other things? In the meantime, <clears throat> biogeochemical flows of nitrogen and phosphorus, basically uh, to boost agricultural production, we mine uh, uh, materials off of one or two places in the planet, and we basically have shipped an entire island in the South Pacific all over the world to boost the nitrogen levels so that we can grow more plants uh, and feed the world. And so there's been an agricultural, agro-industry revolution that has pushed this one out. Extinctions uh, keep going. This is climate change. This is carbon in the atmosphere. This is the one that we seem to be fixated on. But it's only one of the nine uh, planetary thresholds. Land system change is another threat. And we really don't know about some of these other things. And these are the novel entities, all the toxic heavy metals. Questions? Why is fresh water use saying it's in a safe zone when there's multiple, multiple places all around the world that don't even have fresh water? Um, excellent question. So um, because this is treating the planet as a whole, it's, an, it's a diagram. It's an oversimplification of the problem. It doesn't deal with distribution. Distribution is a whole other ball game. <clears throat> and if you've heard of a man by the name of Karl Marx, he was concerned. He was the one who said, in aggregate, sure, but distribution matters. So this is a, a diagrammatic oversimplification that doesn't take into consideration the distribution. So globally, we have fresh water, even though in lots of localities, we don't. Um, so, so is that like when you have a certain plot of land that's like repurposed it, so then now it's changing something with the... I'm, I don't know. I haven't looked into this. I'm not sh exactly sure what they're talking about. Hi. 
How is it that we're in 2020 and we don't have any data on, say, atmospheric aerosol loading or um, novel entities or third one? Excellent question. So basically, one of the lessons, as soon as you move into this territory where you recognize that your school is doing the best it can, but it's not good enough. By extension, this starts to destabilize uh, the perspective of youth. And you start to move into the scary world where you are the adults in the room. And I'm trying to accelerate that process. Sorry and you're welcome. Your school is doing the best it can, but it can't be trusted to do what is necessary. Your parents, I'm telling you, I told you this, your parents are doing the best they can, but they have limitations. Maybe you're hyper aware of your parents' limitations. Your parents, God bless them, they're doing the best they can. Look at where they've gotten you. Thank you, parents. But have some empathy for them. They cannot do it, everything that is required. Your mayor, your governor, your president, your government, the United States government, I'd like to, I wish I could say it's doing the best it can, but trust me, it can do a lot better than this, right? But right now we're in a situation where this is as good as it's gonna get for, for the uh, near future, and you can't trust your government to take care of what is needed. You can't trust the United Nations, you can't trust um, alliances of uh, countries because they have their own personal decision spaces, their own national decision spaces. They're looking out for number one. Malaysia is looking out for Malaysians. And so Malaysia is not going to sacrifice things to help the planet until they see someone else taking the lead. Who's, who's available to take the lead? Historically, recently, it's always been the United States setting uh, a good example for the other nations of the world. But the United States could do a better job than it's doing. But even on a good day, the United States can only do so much. And that's why NATO and the European Union, European Union is kind of taking over. They're the ones setting the rules for internet uh, privacy now. Have you noticed that? It's the European standards for internet uh, privacy that are dominating uh, the, the shape of the internet moving forward. So this is where you go to look at more of this if, you're, if you want to dig deeper. So um, reflexive, looking for reflexive system behaviors as a, a part of the larger game theory analysis of the world yields a lot of insights. And uh, it helps us understand how the Dutch, we've done this, I know, how the Dutch responded, the Dutch architecture urban landscape system, which is, a, which is a built environment. It is the object of architectural uh, scrutiny and action. Uh, looking at the history of deaths in this logarithmic scale, um, the Dutch have uh, compelled uh, it compelled them to take direct action. And we looked at this, they developed the dikes, the windmills that drain the land that is half of, half of the Netherlands is at or below sea level. And so they developed an infrastructure system like the sink in Connor's dorm. This is the physical system that then established a set of rules. If Tanner owns this land, uh, then everybody else in Tanner's village has to keep an eye on Tanner. Because if Tanner decides to save some money this week or neglect not just the kitchen sink in his house, but he's going to neglect the upkeep of the dike because it, you have to repair uh, the erosion from rainstorms, Tanner has to take care of his dike just like everybody else has to take care of their dike because what happens if Tanner's dike uh, breaks? Is it only Tanner and his family that suffers? No, everybody suffers because 
Tanner's dike is, is protecting the entire village. Tanner has responsibility for one segment of the dike, then I'm next to Tanner. Connor's next to Tanner, and Connor has to take care of his segment of the dike, and everybody in the village has to take care of their segment of the dike. All it takes, the dike is only as strong as the weakest link. The village is only as safe as Tanner's attention to his dike. Right, the sink, and it's the same as the kitchen sink. The sink is only as clean as Tanner is able to keep it. So based on this physical system, the Dutch had to develop a political system for managing people like Tanner. The Dutch had to come up with something called the water boards, not to be associated with water boarding, totally different. The water board um, is a collective group that makes sure that everybody, including Tanner, is taking care of their segment of the dike and the most important people to be represented on the water board are the people most likely to neglect their dike. So a smart water board would make Tanner the, the chair of the water board. Do you think that'll work, Connor? To, put, to make Tanner the chair of the water board? No, we would be in shambles. Or would it? So everybody has to pay attention to Tanner and make sure Tanner is taking care of his own shit, right? Friends don't let friends drop the ball, especially when all of, our, uh, all of our fates hinge on whether or not Tanner uh, does his job. And so it's a political system that puts uh, Tanner at, as the focus of attention, as the person who needs the most attention. And the entire country of the Netherlands is, uh, is one of these systems. It is collectivized uh, responsibility for each of, these are the, this is a map of the water board. There are green level local water boards that report to the uh, yellow level larger water boards and then the larger water boards, the regional water boards are outlined in red. So it's a very serious governmental structure. And once you have people talking to each other, uh, according to these mechanisms, it's not just managing the, the defensive water systems, the landscape design and the windmills and all of those systems. You also have an extremely effective governmental structure for managing schools and school finance and road construction and elections and you name it. Anything that a government is capable of doing, it can do better because it takes whoever needs uh, the most support to pull their weight. It makes them the focus of the activity of each of these levels. So Tanner is going to become the head of this water board because he's gone from being the worst the least responsible person to because he's been the focus of so much attention, he now realizes that he and everybody need to take care of their shit. Does that make sense? So we talked about food scarcity. The Dutch have um, been able to do an awful lot. Um, but now we're going to talk about game theory. One of the direct outcomes of this polder mentality in the Netherlands is a direct access to these ideas of game theory. The same game theory rules that put Tanner in charge of the water board uh, is available for all kinds of other things. So this is, uh, this is a map area. This is Amsterdam there. This is Rotterdam down here. And Amsterdam, Rotterdam. Utrecht, uh, Delft, Scheveningen, all these towns around. And this is the Ronstadt area. It's a ring of towns connected by high-speed rail um, and uh, agricultural, a very productive agricultural heart. This is where the food of the Netherlands comes from. And so they have a strong incentive to uh, sustain the ability of the land to produce enough food for this very high population density. And so over the years, 
instead of sprawling the way we will see Los Angeles and other US cities, they have been able to sustain a tremendous amount of population and economic growth by densifying their cities and leaving the landscape open. And part of this is also a strategy for coastal flood uh, defense. Uh, they have the North Sea trying to flood from here, but they also have uh, three of Europe's main four rivers coming through here. So when it rains in the Alps, uh, they have to, a few days later, they have to watch out for flooding threats from the rivers. So they create these landscape systems where the landscapes, they could build walls like they did after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and they build really high walls, but that uh, breaks up the access to the landscape. They've come up with a different defensive strategy where they allow lands to flood so that the water has a place to go. It reduces the pressure on the dikes protecting the cities. And so because their cities are compact, relatively compact, it allows them to, uh, in an economic fashion, defend their cities. Does that make sense? Questions? So in 1995, uh, we did this. The, the Dutch government said, we need 800,000 new houses. And um, in the 90s, the Dutch were saying, enough of this government control, this polder water board governance system. We want to, uh, we watch TV, we see Hollywood movies, we see friends, uh, we see uh, music videos. We want to live more like Americans do. We want single family houses. So um, this Harvard graduate, Adrian Hoyza, uh, said, OK, let's look at what 800,000 houses look like. So um, they enslaved a series, uh, you know, hundreds of, of uh, architecture students and uh, put them to work on the, wood, on the table saw to create 800,000 houses. And then they invited uh, different designers to arrange those 800,000. They gave each one like a couple thousand houses so they could make pretty designs. They could do nice designs of urban design. And so different people took different approaches. Uh, and, but by the, time, by the time they had all 800,000 houses, this is what it looked like. And the impact of this data visualization, this is like an extreme scenario testing, which uh, is what the graduate students are doing right now uh, in the studios. They're doing extreme scenario testing based on this type of approach. And basically, the takeaway is it doesn't matter how skillfully the architect designs the house. It doesn't matter how skillfully the urban design team designs local neighborhoods. 800,000 single family houses is the kiss of death. We don't have enough land in the Netherlands to follow in the footsteps of the United States. And they came to a similar decision as Japan did after World War II when they rejected the development aid planning of the United States after uh, the atomic bombs. And they decided to, uh, the Dutch decided to, and this is a competition. Uh, this is an entry by Rem Kolhas and his office, the Office for Metropolitan Architecture. And this is an example uh, of an extreme scenario test. And they said, let's say the green heart, the agricultural uh, breadbasket of the Netherlands, uh, let's just keep it completely open and let's take all of the population of the Netherlands, which looks like this, and let's distribute them at the, at the population density of Los Angeles. What would that look like? And so they modeled that. And they said, uh, what if all these people move to the southern part of the country, leave this for agricultural activity, and we made this uh, just a huge network of cities that's closer to the European Union trading partners? What would it look like? Uh, do they actually want to do this? No. This is not 
uh, the final review for this design proposal. This is an extreme scenario test at the beginning of the semester so they can just learn what would happen if we took this extreme approach. And so they kept doing this. They said, let's empty out the agricultural land of the Randstad. Remember Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Delft, uh, Utrecht. Let's empty up the land. That's what it looks like. This is what they're modeling as. And let's take, <coughs> let's take this famous architectural proposal and let's say all of those, all of the population is going to, we're just going to do this over and over and over again and see what the, what it scales up to. What's the build out scenario? And this is what it looks like. And then they evaluate that outcome in terms of large uh, outcomes. Like what does it do for transportation? What does it do for housing? Uh, and so these are extreme scenario tests that are also build out scenarios. Then you take uh, this new Babylon proposal and what happens if we did the new Babylon proposal and built it everywhere? Let's see what happens and they evaluate that. Then they said, what if you could only build a house in this green heart if you were within a uh, one kilometer walking distance to a train station or a five kilometer bicycle distance to a train station. So this is a scenario with no cars, walking and bicycling to train stations. This is what the urban development pattern for 54,000 homes would look like. And so uh, this design competition yielded a lot of understanding of what is the relationship between small scale decisions, let's say at an architectural scale, what are the implications for those choices if they were extrapolated and we see that uh, the long term consequences at the urban or regional scale or national scale. And as we move through the semester, one of the topics we're going to look at is the impact of the American suburban single family house. How many people grew up in an American suburban single family house? So um, if we had these tools available, so we're going to look at the the fallout, the unintended consequences of the single family house in the United States, which is continuing to uh, spread over the entire planet. So um, we're going to see the big consequences of that decision. What if uh, in 1945, World War II ended, uh, a group of architects did this? They, someone came up with the single family house, quarter acre of land, driveway, uh, cul-de-sac that connects to a feeder road, that connects to a town center, that connects to a highway system, that connects to a city. If we had looked at the unintended consequences of the single family house, would we have done it? We will look at that in a few weeks. But more about uh, extreme scenario testing. Um, a lot of the graduate students uh, are trying to get their hands on these two books. They're out of print. Uh, Rem Kohlhaas's firm, Office for Metropolitan Architecture, OMA, has spawned a lot of spin-off architectural firms. One of those firms is MVRDV in Dutch, or MVRDV. That's Maas. Van Rijs and it's De Frau. So three people left uh, Ram Kohlhaas's office and they formed this firm. And they have been, uh, since the 90s, a big promoter of these extreme scenario testing. Uh, this book is long out of print, but one of my students uh, just found one on eBay for $65. Uh, a few years ago, it was several hundred dollars. I'm not sure why the price is coming down. Supply and demand. Um, and then, so this is a floor area ratio maximum. What happens if you take the entire population of the world and put it in one place? 
What are the architectural implications for that? What are the architectural implications of taking the entire population of the planet and creating a city that is 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters high? So one kilometer square and one kilometer high. The whole human population into that cube. What happens to the architecture? And based on those studies, they have come up with a set of tools for uh, establishing parameters for performance of architecture in extreme scenarios and possible outcomes for how uh, humans can occupy space in extreme situations. Questions? <clears throat> we did Singapore. Do you see how Singapore might be a game theory? The punchline of Singapore, let me just review the punchline of Singapore, is that when Singapore was expelled from Malaysia in 1965 and Lee Kuan Yew went on television and burst into tears as he told uh, the population of Singapore that it had been expelled from Malaysia. Because the expectation was that Singapore would uh, then uh, ex experience starvation, disease, and massive die-off. Basically, that was the strategy of Malaysia, was like, to hell with Singapore. We can't deal with you, Singapore. All these Chinese people, all this communism coming up, all these slums, they don't have a, a hint of, there's no food production. They, they're dependent on everything from the mainland. It's just a small island. It was a less than a million people, around a million people at the time. And uh, the expectation was uh, the whole world expected people to die in droves. Uh, but Lee Kuan Yew uh, took, he's famous for saying, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Crisis circumstances uh, tend to give us the courage, because there's not many options, to actually look at the world more honestly and identify the game theory aspects of this. So he looked at the equation of what, why, why is the population of Singapore going to die? And it boiled down to economics, housing, transportation. Um, the port was a key asset, food, water. It needed all of these basic things. And as part of this massive transformation mobilized by Lee Kuan Yew and his team, that a, one part of that was housing and transportation. Basically, they built the same public housing towers that you see surrounding Wentworth campus. The same architecture. But instead of warehousing poverty and uh, misery in public housing and then abandoning it as we did in the United States. Uh, a majority of the population of Singapore lived in these houses and they were cared for, they were maintained, they formed uh, associations where they could self-manage, it respected the local customs and cultures, and they can't get to work by driving because no one has cars so they built a, a metro system, basically like the T, and they, they put the T stations, they coordinated the T stations, the metro stations, to, and the housing. So you had lots of high density, high rise public housing surrounding the, the transit stations. And so people didn't have to have cars. They made great schools. They paid their teachers well. So now they had a highly educated workforce living in high quality housing at low cost with uh, government provided pension funds and retirement 
Uh, and so all of a sudden they had a good workforce with low costs and so it became one of the most attractive manufacturing centers in the world. So that provided the economic flow. They didn't steal the money, they folded that money back in. And now at a population of five million, Singapore is one of the most successful uh, cities in the world. Uh, so between 1965 and 2020, they went from uh, imminent death to uh, success story. They are now exporting that model to whoever's interested. Cities in China and India are embracing the Singapore model. I was there uh, a few weeks ago and uh, just in the short time between my visits, I've been there a dozen times or more, um, it has totally transformed. Some of the most bizarre. Have you seen the, the jewel at the airport? Have you seen those videos? There's a a, a giant uh, glass structure that dips in the middle and water comes down and they project a light show on it. I'll put that into the next version of the lecture. So uh, we remember this. It's not so much any of these problems individually because we know how to solve these problems. It's the decision. I can now say what I've never been able to say before because we went so deep into game theory. It's the way the decision spaces are structured that prevents us from uh, developing reflexive responses. Because uh, our decision spaces have been distorted, uh, that they've, they've been locked. The thing that happened with the ozone layer, the self-protective move that a uh, countries all around the world got together, they signed a treaty, and they pushed back the ozone depletion crisis. That was a healthy reflexive system response because the countries were able to talk to each other. It wasn't the prisoner's dilemma because the countries can talk to each other. It wasn't the tragedy of the commons because the roommates got together and they gave Tanner a talking to, and so he was uh, incentivized and maybe they got a two contain compartment sink so even Tanner was incentivized to stop um, wrecking things for everybody but something happened something happened uh, something has been happening and continues to happen that prevents us from getting together and having a collective system response that is appropriate on the big issues uh, beyond ozone. And um, that's something that we're going to try to figure out in this course. Uh, but let's leave with a slightly deeper dive into Medellin, Colombia. How should we say the name of the city? Who speaks Spanish? Medellin. How do you say it? Medellin. Medellin. So you're from Latin America? Where? Guatemala. Guatemala. So in Medellin, people say Medellin. But elsewhere in Latin America, we say Medellin. Medellin. It's just the proper way of accenting the double L. The double L. Um, but in Spain, what would they say? Medellin. It would be a Y, Medellin. Medellin. So everyone say, how would should we say it? Medellin? Medellin. Well, like <laughs> <laughs> the proper way of saying it is Medellin. Okay. Let's say it the way Tamara is saying it. Okay. You say it, then everybody says it. Then you say it, and everybody says it. And you say it, and everybody says it. Three times. Say it loud. Medellin. 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 Okay. So we did the whole murder capital of the world. Never before in human history has there been more murders recorded in a single year. What? You don't remember that? I'm sitting front and center. Don't play me like that. 
You, but I, that's why I'm reminding you. Never before in human history have there been more recorded murders. I did this whole thing. What's the most dangerous place in the world right now? <laughs> Caracas, Caracas, Venezuela. It's like 120 murders per 100,000 people in a single year. What was it at Medellin? It was close to 400 murders per 100,000 people. Never before seen. Um, and in the middle of this, Sergio Fajardo, this math PhD from Milwaukee, son of an architect, steps into, he walks through the streets without bodyguards, uh, people throng to him. He says, we're not going to steal. He loses an election, then he wins an election. And they basically, they look for the worst problems. They, they put a pin in the map every time a body is found. And then they step back and they glaze over their eyes, they blur their vision, and they decide wherever the most bodies are found, that's where they're going to build the most beautiful architecture anyone has ever seen. The campaign is based on the idea that Medellin is the most educated city in Latin America. Was it? No. They were faking it until they could make it. They said Medellin the most educated as a vision for the future. And to make it so, they, they took the location where Pablo Escobar piled the most bodies. No one was living there. That was convenient because no one, they either had died or fled. And so they built a state-of-the-art library park. And then to connect, it, connect this population with the uh, uh, opportunities of the rest of the city, they put in a ski lift for rich people. But now it's not for rich people. It's for uh, these neighborhoods that have been left out, uh, murdered at high, um, at high rates. This uh, part, this neighborhood was at war with this neighborhood uh, as part of the drug wars, the competition between different factions of the cartel. And so they got together and they decided to build a bridge. Uh, and now they're connected. These people come to this library park to take advantage of all the programs housed there, the activities there. And this neighborhood goes over here to the sports uh, facilities um, that activates so much of the life there. <clears throat> um, in the library, the kids have access to computers. Instead of ducking, and they, they used to do their homework under the beds because the bullets, when they flew, would pass right through the corrugated uh, steel of the houses. And kids were getting killed, so they would go under the beds to do their homework to keep them out of the line. This is Sergio Fajardo. In the year 2004, we got into power. We were a, a group of people <coughs> from different sectors of society who had created a civic independent movement. And we had perfectly clear what we wanted to do once in power, to fight the ine social inequalities and the violence that we have had in our city. And we needed the formula, the recipe, in order to face those challenges decrease violence, and whenever we decrease violence, then we immediately, we came up with the social opportunities. Those social opportunities were centered about education. How education, understood in a broad sense, which meant education, science, technology, development of productive activities, culture, all those things together should be the way we should go in order to become a better, much better society. So there are now 20 uh, library parks. This is Jose Darío Gallego. He was blinded in a car accident more than 30 years ago, and only recently he dared to face a computer. Because in the library park Belén, they encouraged him to take the course, in spite of his handicapped condition. Designed by Japanese architects. 
convertir estos lugares que antes eran de represión. Porque aquí estaba el eje 2. On the location of a revolutionary a military base. Uh, they built this library. So they take the worst situations and uh, that's where they put the best architecture and the most powerful solution. One more of these. The second mayor, after first Fajardo and then Salazar. He was a writer. So questions about this. This is Sergio Fajardo in uh, Watson Hall. Yeah. In the reading, yeah. My favorite library park because it is totally integrated. There's no barrier between the houses. You, you know, for 60 or 70 years, development aid would go in. Step one, bulldoze all the houses because that's the cause of problems, right? Dam architects think that the houses is all that matter. Well, they said, no, please don't bulldoze our houses. Um, our houses are fine. Just give us access to world-class facilities and we'll take care of the rest. And that's uh, what happened. So moving forward, uh, we will use your work, uh, your analysis work, your choice of sites uh, to help us understand uh, the implications of this approach. Why the decision space, the game theory, reflexive. The reflexive part of this is before the architects started designing, they basically took the community groups and leaders and they said, you guys are the clients. You tell us what you want us to put in the uh, competition, uh, what, are the, what are the criteria for success and failure of the architectural competition? These people were on the jury, and when um, the architect was awarded the prize and came in and said, here's what I'm thinking, they pushed back and they said, no. Well, thank you, this yes, but this no. We want it like this. So they were the clients. And it was very convincing that the government was serious about what they were trying to do. And in four years, they built five of these. They built dozens of new schools, and they renovated over 100 other schools in four years. So it felt like a top-down attack of the architects, but it was done in a way that um, engaged the local communities. So it became the architectural project became a vehicle for convincing the local population that the government was serious about making them the bosses, of, of giving them back the power that was their birthright from the start. And so it was very convincing because the architects were listening to what they were saying. So questions about what to do for the analysis? Like, I still don't. How many people have a sense of what they're looking for in the image that they're going to produce, they're going to choose? So some of you, not sure. Uh, and what are you going to highlight as an analysis in that image? Do you have a sense of what you're looking for? Any evidence of the people, their needs being served and met through the architecture? Questions? Did you get what you needed? Did you get what you were hoping for out of this lecture? Leave your comments below. I mean, no wait, this is not a uh, Facebook channel. Olivia. Um, is there any chance that you'd be posting these on to at some point? Just for like the images and to be able to reference back to me. So posting the, yeah, the yeah, slides? That would be helpful. I can do that. Especially for like the video shows. Okay. It'll, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'll try. I think it might be PDF. 
And maybe I would, I'll, maybe I'll put in links. Just need a visual reminder. Okay. Because like, probably not going to do this till like Sunday. So. Ah. <laughs> so that's a good reflexive mechanism. I'm going to try to respond. <laughs> Cooper's not here. Kira's not here. I, I tried to find Cooper. I was looking for him in the studio. Okay. Are you his buddy? Yeah. I don't have his mail. And I don't look for him for him around the studios. Okay. Thank you. Professor, is this the attendance here? Yeah. Huh? Am I crossed off because I was here or I'm crossed You off? showed up. Okay, excellent. Just I make the list when the room looks empty at 10. All right, I just want to check. Okay. All right, thank you.